Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. This meeting is being recorded uh, for folks to view going forward. So if you need to hop off the call or anything like that, don't worry. Um, it will be available in a couple of days. Um, just some Zoom etiquette as we are all on the meeting together. Make sure that you stay muted um, and you can keep your cameras off just to reduce distractions. Um, that would be great. If you have any questions uh, while we're going through the presentation, feel free to just throw them in the chat um, and we will get to them as soon as possible, maybe at the end. Um, so again, thank you everybody so much for joining. Uh, my name is Tessa. I manage the Homes for Horses Coalition. And today we are super happy and so lucky to have uh, Dr. Rebecca Husted Jimenez with us today. Uh, Rebecca holds a BS in biology from Wofford College, as well as, a, well as a PhD in animal physiology from Clemson University. She is a decorated combat vet veteran and a retired signal officer of the US Army. She's a support firefighter, incident safety officer, and public information officer for the City of Gray Fire Department. In 2008, Rebecca edited and co-wrote the first textbook on technical large animal emergency rescue. She has since then been training technical large animal emergency rescue techniques across the United States and internationally um, for over 25 years. She's published numerous critiques, techniques, journal articles on a variety of technical subjects in large animal rescue and disaster, um, horse barn fires, trailer wrecks, heavy rescue of large animals, and um, you know, super importantly, on equine behavior in those scenarios. Dr. Husted recently in 2022 was appointed chair of the technical committee of the National Fire Protection Association um, uh, related to animal housing. Uh, code 150 and thus contributes to equine livestock welfare committees and other defining technical competencies for large animal rescue and response around the world. So which so decorated. just goes to show if you hang around long enough, they'll let you be the boss. Actually, I think it just comes down to just sticking me with it, but there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. You just ask her, ask her to present as easy as that. She'll share all of her wonderful information with us today. Um, and everything that she's learned over her time in this field. Um, some applicable, applicable tips for all of us um, and managing equine facilities. So without further ado, uh, Rebecca, take it away. I appreciate you having me. So we're gonna talk today about the kinds of things that are sort of hiding in plain sight and dangers around equine facilities. And we're gonna talk about homes for horses and uh, you know that we put horses in. So let's uh, go forth. Hmm. Do I have control? There we go. All right, so first of all, these are the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about uh, you know, getting together with your local fire department, doing pre-plans, uh, doing some electrical inspections of your barns. Those are the kinds of things that people should be doing. Looking at the terrain, I'm actually, I'm actually here with Dr. Kim Holding. She's sitting right next to me. She's, Hi. <laughs> and I'm up in Iowa today and you know, we just, we, we went to lunch and we were driving through a flood zone where, you know, we're looking at the buildings and, and we're thinking six feet of water, it's hard to imagine. So where is your property when it's related to flood? Um, all these kinds of things are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about at some point. But I'm going to tell you, and any of you that know you, and I see several of you names on here that I do like, um, I am very nosy about looking around in other people's barns. When I look around in other people's barns, I think about things that I go, hmm, should you or should you not? What, what's good about what you're doing and what's bad about what you're doing? The one on the left there obviously is an animal control facility. Uh, they, it's a, a great facility, it's brand new and they've done a really good job. But I look for things like fire extinguishers. I look for how much room do we have in the stable? Um, are they putting vehicles in the stable? You know, obviously they are here. So, you know, the things that we shouldn't be doing, um, maybe you shouldn't have something with gasoline inside the, the stable. Uh, do you have enough room? Uh, the one on the right hand side is a, a friend's barn and, and obviously his horses are very happy in that barn, but uh, there certainly is not a lot of room in that barn to, to move around from the perspective of things like barn fire. So we're going to look at a lot of those kinds of things. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to try not to use any cuss words. I'm going to try not to offend anybody. I want everybody to sort of laugh. But really, I want to change the way you think about things, uh, because the things that we hear in the horse industry about how we should or should not do things are not always what we should be doing. 
Um, and really it comes down to, if we could just test, if we could just train our animals to stay out of trouble, then we wouldn't have these problems. I mean, just tell them, hey, stay out of the water tank. Don't do this, don't do that, right? Well, obviously that doesn't work. So it's upon us when we put animals in the kinds of places that we put them, it's on us to prevent those problems. So we have to look around and we have to say, is it possible that this animal could end up doing something sort of what we would consider dumb? It's not dumb, it's just the way they do things, right? Uh, I can't explain how this guy ended up in there, but I guarantee you it had to do with trying to go somewhere else. So we gotta get better about those kind of things. Because you know, I know most of the folks that are on here are horse people. And this is what we see, you know, the things that people purchase for their animals to, to do the things that they normally do with animals, putting them in stalls, uh, putting them in a horse trailer, uh, just trying to get them hay. And then next thing you know, they rub on it, they bump on it, they try to kick at somebody else, they panic inside the trailer. Next thing you know, they're in the kinds of places that we have to deal with in technical large animal emergency rescue, where it makes it a little bit more challenging to deal with. So, you know, you know, when you say make it less possible for them to get in trouble, um, you know, some of these things are really, really hard to think to think about how could a horse do something. And I know there's a joke in the horse industry where we say, you know, I wish we could bubble wrap our horses, but that's obviously not, not easy to do. So um, let's start with something as simple as buckets and tanks for watering horses. I mean, how hard could that be, right? It's fundamental to making sure. Now, what's funny is, you know, here I am in Iowa. <laughs> You guys have heaters for your water buckets. I live in Georgia normally. I don't have to worry about heat. Wait, two weeks ago, I had to heat, worry about heating my water. The point being, buckets are dangerous for all kinds of reasons. They're dangerous because these kinds of hooks can hang on horses' eyelids. Uh, they they can hang on the halter. A lot of people try to do things like, you know, taping or, or duct taping them around the edges. This lady is using uh, something with, with Velcro on it. But, you know, anything that a horse can get something hung up in or put their foot through, they can do it and that can get a horse hurt. Um, but beyond that, there's things that can go on with those, particularly when you start thinking about heating or cooling water that can be very dangerous for animals. So, what are those kind of things? You know, oh, sorry, I didn't warn you. I've got some really graphic pictures in here. Fortunately, both of these horses survived this. Um, veterinarians call these bucket handle tears because it's so common to have their eyelid. They get in there, they catch something on the edge of the eyelid, and then they rip it up. And it's so common that veterinarians look at that and they call it bucket handle tears. So let's try to prevent those kind of things. Other things that can happen, anytime you have water and electricity together, it's never going to be good. So you've got to get an electrician to put that stuff in, or somebody that's trusted, or at least knows how to use a, an ohmmeter. Um, you need to use the, the ground the grounded outlets uh, to be able to plug whatever you're, you're doing for your heated buckets um, or whatever. Use those GCFI outlets. You need to check them regularly. You need to have somebody come by with an ohm meter that knows what they're doing and check it. Because the number of horses, when you talk to veterinarians and they tell you about horses that come in and they are colicking, part of the reason I always go, hmm, do they have an automatic waterer? Do they have a heated water bucket? There's a lot of horses that will not drink if they can feel even a little bit of electricity. So we've got to check those kind of things. And then of course, obviously they can also cause fires um, that you know could impact your entire facility. So that's why we got to think about these things uh, beyond the, the, the obvious. And then of course, being large animal rescue, I have to bring up the other things that can happen. You have to supervise your tanks because animals can get in them. I have a horse, his name in Tornado, and every single water uh, tank that I've ever had, he puts one foot in it and paws with the other one. So what I did was I elevated mine about a foot and now he can't get in it. Well, theoretically he can't get in it. So these are the kinds of places where animals end up. Now, it seems like such a simple thing. Well, let's just pull it over. Well, pulling it over with a thousand pounds in it is really hard to do and probably another thousand pounds of water. So do you have the equipment? What I tell most people to do is call the fire department because they have cutting equipment and or they have the kind of rope equipment that they could use to actually roll that over. And then of course, with the foal in the bottom, that's very cute, but foals unfortunately fall into these kinds of things all the time and drown because they have small body sizes 
um, and they end up in these things and it's awful. Those kinds of tragedies happen all the time. So next thing, and again, another thing that we take for granted a lot, um, the humble stall latch. You know, you don't expect that. How could that be a problem? Well, it turns out they can catch their hip. If you open that door, not quite far enough, and that thing is sticking out, the horse skips out through the, the gate too fast. He's gonna catch his hip, he's gonna catch his stifle, um, he can catch his blanket. Some horses really panic when those kinds of things happen. So then of course they can also get loose um, if they figure it out or they break it. And the worst thing is from the perspective of large animal rescue is sometimes firefighters don't know how to open them. Now that is a typical latch, but we all know there's a zillion different kinds of latches. You know, these are the kinds of injuries that you can get from horses going through that. You know, they skip through really quick. They catch their side. Now, most veterinarians that are looking at this right now, they're like, oh, this is going to be fun to fix, right? Because really, that's a pretty easy, well, easy-ish kind of thing to fix, right? Um, but obviously, that's going to, as an owner, we're going to be very upset, right? And, and that's going to be a long time healing. So the problem that I look at is, how many different ways is there to lock a stall door? Because firefighters, they've never been in a barn before. They don't know instinctively, especially this one. I love these because the latch is actually in the door and you just grab it and lift it. But let me tell you, the first time you see one of those, you don't know what it is. You don't know how it works. And firefighters have the same problem. There's the ones where the door, the pen is behind the door. There's the one that, that has to be lifted off of things. You got to think about, can a firefighter do these kind of things? Is it a mouse trap? There's never going to figure out because they can be very difficult. I've actually got a video that Al Felice took for me a couple of years ago. They're trying to figure out. Now this is, I'm gonna run it one more time. This is smoked out conditions. You can only see what they're doing because we've got the FLIR camera on. It's fake smoke. It's a, it's a good way for your fire department to practice. Um, but the only reason you can see them is because of the FLIR camera. They can't see a thing. They've got their gear on. They can't see very well. They can't hear very well. We've smoked it up. And now they've got these gloves on that they can't, they don't have a lot of dexterity with, and they're trying to figure out how to, to get in the stall and they can't even see very well. So let me run it one more time and you'll see. It is very frustrating and scary to think about they're trying to get into your stall. The first time we did this in this barn, it took them about 12 minutes to get the first horse out. It's terrifying. So obviously that's not a way to handle those kind of things. What I tell people is, your stall latches. Standardize it at the very least, okay? Put a reflective marking on it. Make it obvious where somebody could figure it out. Um, you know, do some maintenance on your stuff. I hate doors and that you have to get on and pull and, and crank on. I love it when the door opens and closes easily. That keeps the animals from getting hurt too, because you open the door, it opens far enough, the animal can get out instead of trying to just wiggle it open a little bit. And then of course, standardization would be great. And of course, teaching firefighters, your local firefighters, when you have them to your place, because you need to have them to your place and have them look around and give you some suggestions on what would work and what doesn't work. Having said all that, what it really comes down to is uh, if, if you think that you have enough time to put halsters and lead ropes on horses, you don't. And so what happens is, if you don't understand how hard it is to do, you got to actually try it. You got to time it. You've got to, to find out how difficult it is for you to actually evacuate your barn. It's really, really difficult to do. And here we go, teaching firefighters how to catch a horse with an emergency lead rope. On the right-hand side is what we would do, right? As a horse person, you know how to put the halter on and fit the little thingy through and catch the lead rope on and those kind of things but a, a firefighter may not know how to do that. So we actually teach firefighters how to catch a horse with an emergency lead rope that we put around the horse's neck and lead them out of the situation. And that works so much better. So electrical issues are the number one cause of barn fires out of everything else. So it comes down to prevention. That means calling an electrician. That means 
getting somebody that actually knows what they're doing to put your facility in. If it's been more than 10 years since you had anybody look at your electrical in your barn, you need to update your facility. Um, and it's going to cost you some money, um, but you can't, you can't take the chance on having those kinds of things happen. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's got to be prevented. It, if you think you're going to be able to respond in a barn fire, we know time and time again, you've got three to seven minutes, depending on your situation, to get all the animals and people out of that barn, and it just doesn't happen. So get a pre-plan, call your local fire department. The next thing is, what's so dangerous about fences? Oh my goodness, fences veterinarians just hate fences because animals end up in them all the time, right? But beyond fences being dangerous, it turns out that the square fence corners are really dangerous because for whatever reason, animals end up in those corners and they're either fighting or they're fighting over the corner um, or they get driven into the corner by a horse that's a little bit more aggressive and then they're like, oh, she's going to bite me. So they try to jump out. And that's when they really hurt themselves. So that's where we get ourselves in trouble. And what we always try to encourage people to do is, you know, limit those kinds of things. It, these are examples of what happens when horses run into the, the corner. They slam into fence panels. The fence panel comes loose. Uh, the one on the right, I don't know if you can see the skid mark. This is a horse that was coming in towards the corner. And of course, he ends up uh, hanging his feet in the in the wire, same way here. So those are the kinds of things. Of course, the horse is going to be very injured, and then of course, um, you've got a you're looking at a large animal rescue. And from this perspective, probably um, it may be easiest just to roll him out of that. But biggest thing is prevent it in the first place. So I understand that that's difficult to do. So this one on the bottom left, that's actually my facility, and there is a gate and a corner that used to be really steep square corner. And so what I did was I added some wood to make it less, it's not really round, but it's less um, uh, steep. And then of course, immediately after that, a tree landed on my gate and I have to fix my gate now. So that's what happens, right? Um, they're drilling or something. I, I don't know what's going on. Sorry for the loud sound guy, but now they're drilling below me in a different room. Anyway, there you go. Um, so this is another example. If you can't do that, at the very least, what you need to do is make sure that the corner is obvious to the horses. So they know where the corner is. Um, obviously, we never want to use barbed wire, those kind of things. Try to make it a little more triangular. Try to make it a little bit more rounded. At make it easy to see and less possible for anything to get caught in the corner and either fight over the fence or get trapped in the corner and, and kicked by another horse because that's when they panic and really get themselves hurt. Yeah, these are these are some examples. If you go to Kentucky, you go to some of the really fancy places, they will have those rounded corners. We all know that the rounded corners are more expensive, but we also know that you can square this, you can make this sort of a triangular uh, a little bit easier. It's not that expensive to do. And it can be retrofitted. So that's something to consider. Back to gate latches. You guys, I have things about gate latches. Apparently I have PTSD about gate latches. And the reason for it is because the damage that I see to animals uh, and situations where animals can't get out because of these kind of gate latches. Again, there's a million different mouse traps on how people do gates. Uh, but the biggest thing to me from the large animal rescue perspective is if they figure out how to handle your gate and there's always one that's smart, they can get loose. They can get the rest of the horses out with them too. So then you're looking at what we call an e-stray. Uh, the situation on the right is probably the most famous one in the last few years. That's actually in Atlanta, Georgia, near me. And 24 horses got loose. They ran down the side of the interstate and people were videotaping them as they were going with morning traffic. Thank goodness they were able to catch all the horses. Um, the, the owners came, the police came, and they were able to catch the horses. You notice that they are leading them up the interstate to get them back to their, their pasture. And I was like, oh my God, that is just a nightmare, right? Nobody got hurt and none of the horses got hurt. But obviously it is possible. Horses do get hit on the side of the road. 
they kill other people, they injure other people, and then of course the animal, it's never good for the animal, right? So, and then of course you are financially responsible. So trying to prevent that problem starts with really good gates and really good latches. So I'm a big fan of those kind of things. So how many of you guys have a disaster plan for when your horses get loose? And this is to prove on the left-hand side, that is my husband, that is my truck, and those are my horses. And they got out down here. And you guys know that when a horse realizes the gate is open, it's only open for about, what, three seconds? And the horse is like, oh, there's an open gate. And they will run off the gate. And that's exactly what happened. All five of my horses took off down the pasture and ran through the open gate and came out here and started eating grass, thank goodness. And we grabbed a feed bucket, we grabbed halters and lead ropes, and we caught two of the horses. Uh, we called 911 because we weren't sure how fast they were gonna run. The reason you wanna call 911 is to let them know there's a possibility of horses in the road so that they can send an officer out and you also tell them, please, when you get here, turn off your sirens. Horses don't care about the bright blinky lights, but they sure do care about sirens. Um, this one on the right hand side was a little bit more advanced maneuver that was a loose horse that was actually a we, we don't know where the horse came from and so we got some portable fencing we weren't sure he was a stallion we weren't sure if he's aggressive or not so we contained him in portable fencing um, you know again do you have a plan for how you're going to deal with a loose horse that is one of the most common uh, emergency situations that happens to just about every single facility. And it doesn't matter if it's horses or donkeys or cattle, most of these animals are used to being fed. So if you grab a bucket and you walk away from them and shake the bucket, a lot of times you'll end up with the animals, wait. <laughs> we all know what'll happen if you shake a bucket and there's way too many horses, right? Anyway, I'm trying to make you guys laugh, but I want you to understand, you know, one or two horses, a bucket, uh, five or 10 or 15 horses, you better be an Olympic runner, right? <laughs> and of course, the other thing that can happen, this is a lady whose horses were out near the road near um, where I live several times. And finally, she got a ticket because the horses kept getting loose and kept getting loose and animal control kept on trying to work with her, but she wasn't improving her fencing. So there you go. And of course, if somebody hits your horse and gets hurt, uh, you might get sued too. So really good reasons for having a backup plan for your animals. It's amazing to me how many people have a horse facility and they don't have a good gate. They don't have a closure on the gate. Um, they don't have signage, you know, please close the gate. Believe it or not, a lot of people were not born in a barn and they don't know that horses will get loose if they leave the gate open. So signage, uh, good closures, good latches, and then of course your plan for dealing with the loose, loose horses if you do that and practice your plan. When new people come to your barn, they should know what the plan is. You don't just run around like they do at the show, you know, loose horse and everybody's running around waving their arms and screaming and yelling and, and it just makes it worse. So come up with a plan. Really what it comes down to is good latches are not cheap and they're not easy to install. To actually hang a gate correctly so that it swings easily and you can get you and the horse through the gate without being crushed by the horse or the horse catching his hip on something actually takes a lot of work. I love these kinds of gates. I have, I have several of this kind of latch myself, um, this one as well. And I love really good gates. I've, I've gotten sort of PTSD about it. So I have a little video for you of my husband walking through one of my gates. There you go. I love a gate that actually shuts. I love a gate that's easy to open. You don't have to crank on it, pick it up off the thing, all those things. Please work on the quality of your gate. Another little nitpicky thing. If you have bungee ties anywhere in your trailer, in your barn, see what the, the veterinarian's saying. She's saying, no, 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 please don't, okay? Because these kinds of things are awful. Just cut them up in pieces or burn them. Do not give them to anybody else. These things are awful. Um, when they stretch, when a horse really panics, they can, they can gain a lot of energy. Some of these things can hold up to 12,000 pounds, believe it or not. Um, and then of course, when they get older or the stitching starts to go, or there's a problem with it over time, they can break and they can snap back. They can hit a horse. They can hit a, 
a horse in the eye. They can hit a person in the face or in the eye. I've met people who have lost eyes. I've lost, I've met people who've had horrific lacerations and horses that have also so lost eyes from these things. Bungee ties are awful. And we find them all over in cross ties, in, in, in barns. Uh, we find them in trailers where people tie them in trailers on the outside of trailers. Just cut them up. You don't want to listen to me, listen to Rick Wallace. He um, had a very famous horse, Ultimate Victory, who ended up spooking in the cross ties and it came back and popped him in the eye and they actually had to remove his eye. So if you don't wanna listen to him, me, listen to him. That's actually a picture of it. You can tell the stitching just gave on that thing. So they're awful, 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 awful. These are some pictures of some of the things that happen when, you know, uh, eye injuries are awful in people as well as horses. And you know how, what happens in horses, they're like, they put their head up and they're like, no, 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 no. So what usually happens is the, the veterinarian ends up having to put an SPL in so that you can do the treatment of the eye on a regular basis. And it's expensive, it's difficult, it's painful. It's many, many reasons to just take the bungee cords out of your thing in the first place. Um, while we're talking about bungee cords, you know, think about when you're tying with anything, uh, halters and trailer ties, the, the webbing that's on this blue halter here uh, the little rope that's that's hanging this horse is hanging on where he slipped down in the trailer and he's sort of hanging by his face has a working load limit of about 4,000 pounds, which means literally you can hang uh, a small elephant on this halter and trailer tie. People don't realize that. Put something in the system up at the top that will break. The polypropylene orange twine that we use on our hay, that breaks about 400 pounds. Believe me, a horse jumps and panics, it will break. A piece of sisal twine, uh, the hay string, will also break at about 150 pounds. So put something in the system that will break when you go to tie them up. And this is other examples. You know, this is the sisal twine. There's things out there called equine pings. This is just a simple piece of rope um, attached in your barn so that if something really goes wrong, you're not trying to hang a, an elephant on it. You know, you want it to break. Um, use some kind of a weak link. You need to use it in your trailers. You need to use it in your barns, your cross ties, any of those kind of things, and especially for horses that you're teaching to tie um, and really warn your friends and tell your stores to stop selling them. Tractor Supply has a million of them, and, and I just, I, I ask about it all the time, and they're like, oh, well, we sell them all the time. I'm like, yeah, I know. Take them out. Okay. While we're going to your barn, we got to pull up the driveway, right? How does a fire truck fit down your driveway? Can it get through your gate? It, you know, what is your plan? If you've got a pretty gate like that, how do they get through the gate? Do they have to poach in the code? Do they have some other device to do that? Is it going to fit? Because what's funny is that a lot of fire trucks are huge. And we think, well, I can get a four horse trailer down through there. And they go, yeah, but a, the fire truck turns like the Queen Mary. It's a barge, right? It, it's really hard to do. And of course, in the dark, in the rain, uh, under bad conditions, um, when they get down your driveway, can they turn around? You know, if it's a sort of one of those fancy driveways that has trees hanging over it, or it goes like this, if they can't get there, you know, have the fire service out to your place. Hey, can you get your trucks down my driveway? If not, some trees got to go. You got to straighten it out. You got to put some gravel down so that they can get their turnaround. Um, if the local fire department and rescue people, you know, we always think about fire, fire, fire with barn fires, but really it comes down to if somebody has a heart attack at your facility and they can't find you, especially in the dark or the rain or the traffic or whatever, um, you're slowing down their response time, right? And we don't want to slow down the response time. This is probably the best one, right? So this truck tried to go across, hang on. This truck tried to go across this bridge and there'd already been four trucks over the bridge and there's no way out otherwise. So the entire department's contingent of trucks is now trapped on that side of the bridge. And that is an abject emergency for that community. So we don't want those kind of things to happen. But I think you can see, you know, a fire truck needs something about 14 feet high and 12 feet wide. So it needs to be, that's very pretty but they're not gonna get, be able to get to your facility for those kind of things. The next thing to think about is, can they find you in the dark? So people say, well, I have this, uh, you know, this little sign right here. Well, that one, they're not gonna be able to see. This one, they'll be able to see better. 
So I, you know, they're never going to see that, that in the dark, you just can't see any of that. So I want you to have a reflective address sign that's close to the road where the firefighter that's driving by in a fire truck at 45 miles an hour can see it. At least three inch white reflective lettering on some kind of a background. Um, it needs to be close to the road. You got to clear the weeds out. You got to do those things because this is the exact same uh, mailbox and you can actually see it in the dark. So, and sometimes these get older. Some people have had them for 20 or 30 years. Go out and check yours. If you can't see it at night, get a new one because that is fundamental to the fire department and the EMS guys trying to make it to your facility. All right. Now, a lot of people are like, now, Rebecca, this is crazy because there's a barn fire. Surely they can find me. And I go, yeah, we can see the smoke in the light. You know, we should know where the, which, which barn is burning, right? Preferably we catch it long before it gets to that because this, there's nothing to save. Um, in the dark, we may be able to see your barn burning. The problem is in many communities, especially with horse people, there's several driveways that one goes to the house, one goes to the barn, one goes to the hay barn, right? Or this one goes to your place with your horse barn and then the next door neighbor, which looks like it's almost where yours at at 45 miles an hour in the dark. Um, the point is you gotta have the address correct, okay? And then you gotta make it accessible because Fire trucks weigh 30, 40,000 pounds. They don't drive on mud. They don't drive on, on dirt. They like gravel. They like asphalt. They like concrete, okay? Um, you can't drive them across a culvert or a weak bridge. Uh, really need that nice wide thing. And this is, you know, this is my place. When I first got there, there were some beautiful trees all through here, right? And... It was painful, but I had the, the companies come out and take a bunch of those trees down. And I love trees. I'm a naturalist too, but I had to take some trees down because I needed to be able to have things like rock trucks and fire trucks and those kind of things be able to access my driveway. So, you know, can get close to the facility. Can you drive around the facility? Do you have water? Do you have hydrants? Those are the kind of things you're going to ask your fire department to take a look at with you and say, hey, you know, is there actually a problem here or is there something I can mitigate on, on this situation? This is a good example. You know, you come to one address and this is a large facility, obviously, but there's one, two, three barns. And then this one looks like a barn too. So when you call, hey, come to the barn, which barn? Have you labeled the barns? Barn one, barn two, bar, barn A, barn B, bar, whatever. Whatever works. But that's where you sit down with your fire department and say, what's going to work for me, for my situation, particularly in the dark. OK. Now, let's walk out there to the parking lot and let's take a look at our trailers, uh, because that's also something that we use a lot. And I just hate it. This is a guy that came, an uh, animal control officer that came to one of my training events. And I said, dude, this is like that little, you know, that, that little meme. Um, this is the teeny tiny bit of reflective that he had on the back of this trailer. And he goes, yeah, but I've got LED lights. And I go, yeah, that's great. You've got LED lights here, here, and here. And then if, if you're just right, you can sort of see that one. But guess what? There's always problems with electrical on trailers. And sometimes that might pull off, those kind of things. And that's all they can see. So why not put some really good reflective, the conspicuity tape, on your trailer. And why should we do that? Because these are the kinds of things that happen. You know, unfortunately, this is a really common incident. People can't see. This is a good example. This one actually happened in Georgia. It's actually got the horse in the trailer. The horse was fine. Thank goodness. But the, the car slammed into the back of the trailer. It's a heavy duty steel trailer. So thank goodness it didn't do any worse damage. But you can see that's one of those old analog lights. And that's all she's got on the trailer. That's crap. People cannot see you. And of course, this one, that, there's nothing to save in that one once some, that happens. Uh, I know a horse died in that one. So get some reflective on your trailer. And I will tell you, the other thing that this brings up is I like two ways to keep a horse in a trailer. So doors and a ramp or doors and a butt chain or a butt bar or a something to keep them in the trailer. Um, because it is far too, too common for a latch to come off a door, for something to break. 
uh, for something like this to happen and then the animal steps out. And if the animal steps out at 70 miles an hour, you guys, I don't need to show you the pictures. I've got them if you wanna see them, but you don't really wanna see it, what happens. Um, so two ways to keep that animal in that trailer, if at all possible. And then of course, you know, get the conspicuity tape. It's not cheap, but that's why the manufacturers don't put it on the trailers because they're willing to sell you a trailer and they're going to say, hey, I made a couple extra hundred bucks. I didn't have to put all that conspicuity tape on that because the owner didn't know any better. So this is somebody that came to the training before and after. You know, they put a lot of conspicuity tape down here. I also like to see it here. And when you open the doors, if God forbid you ever have to unload a horse on the side of the road, I don't ever want you to have to do that. But if you did, I would like you to have some conspicuity tape on the inside doors so that you can at least warn somebody that the door is open, right? And then, of course, I would also like to see some conspicuity tape on the sides, mainly because when you drive your trailer and you make a turn, especially left across traffic, as somebody comes across the hill, you want them to be able to see your trailer. So at the bottom and the top of your trailer on the side, especially if you got one of those big four horse or eight horse or 10 horse trailers that com comes across the road, it takes you a while to get across that road. That's what I want it to look like. Uh, the one on the right is actually Tori and, and Justin McLeod's. And, uh, you know, when you pull into their driveway or my driveway, it looks like you've pulled into a, an airport, right? <laughs> but that's what I want it to look like. So pull up behind your trailer and see what it looks like in the dark. You want to get more conspicuity tape on your trailer. Okay. This is something that's sort of one of those subtle things that a lot of people don't ever pay, pay attention to. Uh, the little tree that's got a V in it or a split tree that's got a couple of, of things growing up out of it. Uh, horses will come along and they'll scritchy scratch. Cattle are not notorious for doing this too. They scritchy scratch or they're playing or whatever they're doing. And next thing you know, they've got their head trapped in it. They get a foot trapped in it and then they panic. And when they panic, that's when they really hurt themselves. In some cases, they get their entire body through the tree crotch. Um, and prevention really is a preferred way of handling this kind of thing. There's a few pictures. If you go on Google, you will find lots of pictures of animals that are trapped in tree crotches uh, just because animals do the kinds of things that they do, right? Um, very, very frustrating. And a lot of it starts with scritchy scratching their, their bodies on the tree because it feels good, getting the hair off, those kind of things. But uh, those can be really difficult to deal with. This is actually one that was in my yard. That is my house. This was in my yard and I used my yard as um, a paddock uh, for my horses. It has to be supervised because you guys know what horses do. And what we decided to do with this tree, it was just at the correct height that you could tell a horse would try to mess with it. So we actually removed one side of the tree. And uh, you know, you can block the crotch off by putting some wood on it. You can fence it off around the tree. That's what a lot of places do. Um, it's an expensive way to solve the problem. Um, or whatever you gotta do to stop them from rubbing, scratching and playing with that tree, um, make it less possible for them to get something caught. Because I'll save you the pictures where it goes wrong. Those, those other ones are sort of funny pictures. But when it really goes wrong, it's, it's awful. How many of you guys looking around the rest of your place have a pretty pond in your pasture? I have one. Um, the thing is, at certain heights of the water, that can be an entrapment problem. And depending on what the environmental temperature is, it can turn into an ice situation. So um, from the perspective of the environment, it is important to have uh, most of your pond or your water course that goes through your property should be a riparian area. That's the fancy name for you need to protect it because otherwise it becomes eroded and it destroys the water quality. There's all kinds of other things that can go wrong. Um, but like on my property, I have a limited area where the animals can come to water and it's graded, it's got sand, so it's easy for them to get in, easy for them to get out. Um, the problem that we really see with mud rescue is when the when we have a drought and the water level drops and for whatever reason those little seeds that are at the bottom of the mud they haven't seen sun in you know 20 years or 100 years or a thousand years and all of a sudden those seeds are like yay there's sun and they'll hatch out well now you've got this beautiful green grass down there in your crummy muddy pond and the horses try to go to it and that can be really da dangerous for entrapment 
Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it happens that animals end up on those crummy edges. And for example, this one, this horse has lived in that pasture for many, many years. She's drank out of that lake many, many times for whatever reason. Uh, she got too close to the edge and the edge sort of crumbled. She fell down into the edge of it and she wasn't able to get back out. We were able to su successfully pull her out using a, a sideways drag. But this one, this was, it got really cold back in 2018. That's just, you know, that's like a quarter inch of ice. But what happened is the horse was playing in it probably. He's got a blankie on. It got wet. He, for whatever reason, slipped and fell. Uh, you can see that the edge is pretty icy and nasty. Once he slipped and fell, once a horse is down and then he's got the added weight of that watery blanket, he's not moving anywhere. So now you've got a horse that's wet and cold and we've got to do an extrication on. Let's just prevent the problem by limiting their access when you have a surface ice uh, pop possibility. So make the access point sandy. This is a good example of a nice safe pond. It's nice and flat, there's sand, makes it easy for the horse to get in there. That's my cute husband in his, in his tight pants <laughs> and nice stable footing. And then of course, of course, the rest of it, protect the riparian edge because we're supposed to be doing that for, for the environment. Ask your uh, local extension service how you can protect the rest of the riparian zones around your pond. And all of a sudden, if you do that, you'll see a lot more of the uh, wildlife species that you want to see. Also ask your fire department, do you have any training in surface um, mud rescue? Uh, do you have surface ice rescue training? And they'll look at you like, what? <laughs> And you say, would you know how to get a horse out of that mud situation? Or would you know how to get a horse out of that surface ice rescue situation? And they'll probably look at you funny. So we can get them some training if, if we need to. So how do we make it safer? Safer way to do that is fence it off if all possible, especially like you can tell this is really steep along here. So what they've done is fenced it, okay? Uh, before the snow and the ice in the winter, uh, you can use temporary electric fence if your horses are good about that. It depends on how much snow you've got. I know that snow can be uh, challenging when it comes to electric fencing, um, but if it's steep or for whatever reason, you know, fence it off, use some electric, whatever you gotta do to protect that area, uh, particularly if there's it's really fast water flowing uh, along rivers. Find a place that's safe for the animals to access, and maybe under certain conditions, you have to fence it off. All right. Stall bars and stall rungs. Um, this is part of the, the stalls that we often see with people. Uh, the problem comes when a horse goes to kick, and you've got those two stall rungs, and as he kicks, he puts so much pressure on it that it slightly opens while the hoof goes through, but the hoof is wider than the leg. And so once the leg goes through, now he's hung. Um, the, sometimes they get one leg in, sometimes they get both legs in, sometimes they get their whole body through the door. Uh, it comes down to, you know, do we have removable rungs? Uh, can we move the doors? Can we take the wall apart? There's some stalls that are built so that they're pretty easy to remove uh, just by removing the boards. Uh, that's hard to do when you've got a thousand pounds sitting on top of it. Uh, do you have some way to obviously prevent it would be nice just by putting your horses out. But if, if you've got to do this, how do you do extrication? This is an example of what I'm talking about. So animal go through the feed door. Uh, this is the little feeding area where people open that little trap door to feed the horse. The horse decided that they wanted to leave and jumped out that part. Now she's got her weight on the door. That makes it really hard. Um, in this case, the horse kicked backwards at his buddy walking down the aisle, probably, and now his legs are caught in that, and, and these looks like some pretty rough rungs here. So obviously, if you have a uh, cutting tool, such as a reciprocating saw, you may be able to take that off very easily. That's easy said. You can imagine that that's fraught with difficulty when you start using a reciprocating saw around your horse. It's probably going to panic. So have we called a vet? Have we called 911? Because those are the folks that are going to be able to help us with this kind of situation. And then, of course, put a halter on the horse's head if you can access him safely and give him something to eat. Give him some good alfalfa hay or something to keep him busy while you're waiting for the veterinarian and for the, for the firefighters. That is the easiest way to deal with this. We see horses that go over stall doors a lot. So do you have pins that are easily removable or a frangible pin in here? Uh, can you bring his buddy? Uh, this one looks like he's just pretty hang well, you know, just sort of hanging out. This guy's right there with his buddy. Looks like he's pretty well hanging out. So bring a buddy horse, halter and lead. 
give him some feed and hay, call 911, call a veterinarian, let them get there and figure out how you're going to do this. Uh, the challenges with these kinds of things are, you know, sometimes you've got a horse that's, that's pretty easy to work with. They were trying to actually chalk up or build up the area in front of the horse so that they could get enough room right here to be able to pull that, that um, stable front off or lower it but you got to be able to pull the pins. And so that's, that's very difficult to do. I like chalking it. If you, if the horse will work with you, if he's got the right attitude, if he doesn't have the right attitude, get your veterinarian there and they will help you with the correct attitude. <laughs> Happy juice. Uh, this one, you know, it's over a, a gate. The problem is if you just, people say, well, just slide him off the gate. Well, you better have good control of the gate because if you slide him off and there's any square corners, you're going to gut him and you're going to tear his skin and you possibly could tear through some other structures and obviously you could injure his um, stifles too. So be real careful about this kind of thing. Call a vet, get them there. So what are some other things that, you know, we try not to have those uh, steel hoof traps. Anything that's about the right size for a hoof to go into it, uh, horses will do those kind of things. So can we remove some of those kinds of things where animals can interact across them? Um, can we open up spaces between solid walls, not big enough for a horse to put his foot through it, but where he can see his buddies? Guess what? A lot of this kind of thing comes because he's trying to get back to his buddy. He's worried about where his buddies are and he panics, right? And that's why he jumps over these things. But guess what? You go over to Europe and what they're starting to do is come up with using these vertical access panels where horses who are normal buddies out in the paddock are allowed in the stall situation to have interaction with their buddies. Guess what? That's given them a lot more of the, it lowers their, their anxiety. They can come over and interact or they can go the other way. Um, this is a cool idea. This is something that is up and coming on the equine behavior and welfare side um, is allowing horses that are buddies, not not enemies, um, and not that are interested in breeding with each other, but that are buddies, okay? <laughs> I've got two geldings that probably would not do well in this situation. So that brings me, having said all these kind of things, I also want to talk about some of the, the, the elephant in the room, right? Why do we call it a gilded cage in the first place? You know, when we start talking about all these things, it all comes down to we're putting horses in trailers, we're putting them in stalls, we're putting them in barns, we're putting them in that built environment where animals are. And it really comes down to it's affecting their respiratory and musculoskeletal health. Your veterinarians are going to tell you, put them out as much as possible. That helps them with their mental, their physical, and their behavioral health. You know, there's the five freedoms, the five domains of, of welfare. If you want to look it up on Google, you know, friends, forage, and freedom are the ways to think about that. That really you know, why does a horse do this? Because he wants out, you know, he wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to have a choice, you know, so what is that gilded cage for? You know, talking about homes for horses, you know, that is a home for a horse. No, it's not. If you got a fancy barn like that, I'm going to encourage you to do this with it. This lady is actually charging a crap load of money to use her barn to let people stay. It's an Airbnb. And she's getting a ton of money for it. And I promise you, the humans are going to be a lot happier in that barn. Actually, I might like to stay in that barn. <laughs> but, uh, you know, think about it really hard before you even put your horse in a barn in the first place. So, you know, part of it, I, I know this is, this is something we see in, in our urban usage. It's in our literature. It's in our language. We say, put him out to pasture. That's like retiring. And why is that such a bad thing? Nobody ever says, let's go out in the pasture and have some coffee, right? Well, I do, you know, because that's my husband and that's my horse tornado and they're out in the pasture. And he's actually eating pretzels and sharing it with the horse. I can't help it. I live in Georgia. We've been out shooting too. So that's, that's the way it is. The very spoiled horse and a very spoiled husband. But you notice that there's a whip over here, guys, because if you're going to do these things, you always got to have a whip to keep them off of you at some point. The point is, how do we make our balls, barns and stalls safer? I'd really like you to put them out as much as possible, right? But if you're going to put them in, if you're going to put them in those situations, you've got to talk to your local fire department. Do Have them do a walkthrough for your safety and, and fire hazards. You know, increase your turn it 
turnout time. If you ask your veterinarian, they're going to say, please bring them in to feed them and then kick them back out in the pasture. I am going to love it if I ever, before I die, people start charging more for a good outdoor boarding um, situation for a horse than they do by putting them in, in stalls. If you're going to put them in a stall, have a barn fire escape plan, have stall doors to the outside wall. Time and time again, that is the way to be able to get horses out of that uh, barn. They're not going to let you run down the interior aisle because it's too dangerous for everybody, the horses and for you. Update your electrical, update your fans. You know, I go in barns and I see this and I'm like, oh my God, that's such a cage. I mean, it's awful. At least this one has a little bit of airflow, right? But what are they doing? I know the airflow sucks because they've put these crappy fans up here and they're on extension cords. This is an electrical nightmare. These are open on the back side of this fan right here in the back side of this. I know that's not a 507 compliant fan because it's open housing, which means it gathers the dust and those kind of things. And eventually it's gonna catch on fire. If you don't believe me, listen to Lasco products. They said, basically, please don't buy our fans. You know, they present serious fire hazards. Um, they're not open. Uh, they're not closed, grounded. Um, they're not by the, the moisture resistance. They, they're not by the National Electric Code. Please don't buy our fans. If you're going to buy a crappy fan, please don't put it up in this. I, that takes the cake for innovation. But still, it is so wrong. Got pictures of these kind of fans. Even this one, this one sold at um, Tractor Supply and some of the big uh, farm stores. It's still an open housing fan. And technically by the fire code, it should only be run when there's a human being supervising it in the facility. Well, when you go to bed at night um, in Georgia, it's still a hundred degrees outside. What do people do? They leave the fans on, right? And I'm like, just put the horses out. Anyway, okay. If you're going to buy fans, this is a better fan, but you see on the back side of this, you can look through the housing that tells you that's not 507 compliant. This one is 507 compliant. It's uh, got a closed housing. It won't gather all that crap into the fan. However, you still have to clean it. You still have to do maintenance. However, it's still on this, uh, I don't know what this is, some kind of electrical whatever, and it's plugged into this whatever, um, which is just waiting for something to hang on it or rats to eat on it or whatever. So this is the best. This is not a $10 fan. This is gonna cost you 150 bucks or more. It's a closed housing fan. It's a really high quality fan and it's been hardwired into the electrical system so that rats can't chew on the wiring, all those kind of things, right? So our problem is that we got to spend a little bit more money if we're going to make the choice to keep our animals in these built environments. We got to spend the money to try to keep them safe once we do that. There's a million different mouse traps that are out there. I personally like the big fans. Uh, if you talk to the structure, the structural and the ventilation engineers, they'll tell you that the best ventilation for horse barns usually is from above. So the big ass fans, the big, they're very slow moving fans, but they move a lot of air over time. Um, and then something that's 507 compliant. And then there's some that will actually help evacuate um, those smells and um, ammonia, that kind of stuff from the from the entire barn. Just take a look into that and, and have somebody that knows something about ventilation come to your barn. So, you know, what do I do without a barn? You know, I don't have a barn and there are some concerns and these are just some of the concerns that you could worry about. And for every one of these, there is a solution for those kind of things, you know, bad weather and uh, what happens if I have to change my fences to manage my, you know, now I've got a whole, whole herd of horses um, versus individual horses, those kind of things. But it can be solved. If you can't find a solution, get a hold of me. I will help you. Uh, a disaster mindset says, hey, you know, under disaster conditions, how would I solve that, right? Knowing that this is ideal for the horse, um, we had tornadoes coming through the other day and I had people calling me in Georgia asking me, hey, what am I going to do? There's tornadoes coming my way. And I said, Dude, it's not about the horse anymore. Get your mama, get your kid and go, uh, you know, in, in, into the safest place in your home or go to the local fire station and get in a building that's safe for a tornado, right? Don't worry about the horses. The horses are going to have to take care of it at that point, right? 
there are lots of cons for having a barn, okay? So uh, it's, it's much better for the horses, obviously. And these are the kinds of things that happen to horses that are kept in stalls, uh, that are kept in barns on, on long terms. And you can ask your veterinarian, you can ask your equine behavior specialist, you can ask all those people. Do not ask the people that build barns, do not ask the people that are in the business of managing barns, because of course they are in the, it, it, it's much better for them to uh, say, oh yeah, you've got to have your horse in a barn all day. <laughs> uh, you look at the things over the time, we're starting to learn more and more and more about these five freedoms for horses and their behavioral welfare. If you don't want to listen to me, listen to this guy, Peter Fredrickson. He is uh, uh, the ultimate, right? He won the 2020 Olympics on his horse. His horse is barefoot. That is all in his horse uh, at his own home. And this is in his paddock. He also has a choice of shelter and grass. So, you know, more and more people are going to this and giving animals a choice. I'm just asking you to think about a choice because all those things we've talked about for the last hour are all because of the built environment, okay? There's a lot of pros for no barn. It makes it so much more convenient for you. It's so much better for the horse. There's so many other things, right? Um, better ventilation, less barn fire concerns. You don't have to worry about a barn fire if you don't have a barn, okay? We can all agree on that. And then of course, maintenance costs and those kind of things. So there's lots of options. I do encourage you when you look at those options, you've got to think about, hey, now we've got this open area where our horses are going to be running around in our run-in shed because horses will. Are they going to slam into things? Are they going to rub on things? We've got to think about the same kinds of problems that we have with stalls now at speed because the animal is able to move through those areas and more than one animal may be in that area. And now we've got to think about the animals having contentiousness and those kind of things. We've got to think about footing, you know, so that animals don't hurt themselves. There's all kinds of answers to those kind of things. There's track systems. There's, uh, this is a gal in, in Georgia. She's using a track system with electrical uh, fencing to keep her horses moving uh, more often. And she's done a lot of enrichment for her horses. If you've never heard about uh, Paddock Paradise or track systems, uh, you should go take a look at those kind of things. This is another example of um, the Equicentral Equiculture systems are working really hard on having a loafing area where the animals food and water and hay may be in that area and their loafing area where they can relax. And then they go back out to the pasture and do their grazing bouts outside. And uh, looks like there's a lot of, of benefits to that. It lessens the mud. It, it allows you to maintain your grass better. Uh, if you are interested, take a look at some of Jane and Stuart Meyer's uh, work in agriculture. Uh, for a lot of people, they're still concerned about feeding large numbers of animals. So we go to things like feeding stocks. This is... Uh, you know, I use this for my horses at home. They use these for feeding, but they also use it for shelter and they sometimes just hang out. They wanna be in the shade, they go in there and just hang out. They can sleep standing up in those stocks and nobody messes with them while they're snoozing. Um, they use it quite effectively. This is a girlfriend of mine's, hers is much fancier out in Texas but uh, then mine, mine's just a goat shed that's been converted, but it works beautifully for those kind of things. And then of course, thinking about all the things that if we are gonna do these kind of things with running sheds and uh, covered areas and that kind of stuff, how can we think about safety for our animals? We've gotta think about our gates. We've gotta think about good footing because when you start having animals in, especially if it rains a lot, you've gotta think about how can I move the foot, the, limit the erosion, better footing, those kind of things. There's lots of solutions to that. This is some of the mud mats. Uh, that are used with gravel on top of that. Uh, maybe uh, feeding areas that are basically like a small stall. Uh, are you gonna use electrical? You know, electrical is one of those things they, they it's harder to see, but boy, they don't wanna get on it. So if you can mix that with uh, some of the other solutions, uh, electrical is very useful for a lot of people. This is an example of the, the mud fencing, uh, mud matting to try to, to provide better footing for those animals. Uh, if you've got this kind of situation, it's harder for animals to get hurt, right? Um, converted barns, we just got to think about how much speed. You're going to have horses come running, trotting, cantering through here, fighting, doing all the things that horses do in groups. So you got to think, think about places where animals can't get their foot into something, can't get their head into something, can't get something caught, like their, their halter, can't get caught on things. Just got to think about that as you're building this. And I would have made this corner round instead of 
of having a square corner here, especially with electric on the outside. And then of course, sometimes people are like, hey, I've got a piece of property. How can I provide emergency shelter to my animals for this kind of weather? And you just go, hey, I normally say don't blanket a horse, but if it's that cold and you're showing your horse, maybe you need to blanket. Talk to your veterinarian, have them give you some um, tips on, on how, how and when and what and how to do this kind of things. There's a million different opinions out there on the internet, but uh, it can do, be done better for emergency shelter. So I just tried to get a lot of information down into you guys' heads. You can always get a hold of me. It really comes down to working with your local fire department. You need to have a good conversation with your veterinarian about your situation with your horses, particularly in the built environment. Uh, whether or not they should be living in a stall 24 seven. Um, look at reflective address signs, cut those bun bungee cords out, uh, try to fix your known problems, have a safety meeting for your barn. It's amazing to me how many people own barns, they have a bunch of borders and they never all get together and have a safety meeting and say, hey, what are our problems? have a safety meeting. It'll help you improve your daily management. Yes, you may have to spend some money because you got to fix some things, but it's much better to pick, fix some things than it is to deal with the injuries uh, to horses and possibly even to people that may, uh, that may be involved. If you need to get a hold of me for any reason, there you go. Uh, we do have a Facebook study group. It is not a prayer group, so I'm just going to tell you uh, we've got... <laughs> 13 administrators on there. And we're a little bit rabid about people that get on there and say, oh, I hope they feel better. And eh, you're off. So you can get a hold of me at my email. You can get a hold of me at my cell phone there. Uh, I appreciate you. And I'm, I'm willing to answer some questions if we've got some questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat um, or just unmute yourself and ask. I have a question. This is Nina Ekon from University of Denver. Hi, Rebecca. Hey. I'm here. This is so cool. And right down the line, stuff I do with facility design as well. All in line. Love those panels where horses can access themselves, other horses, and eat fiber outside their stalls. We have lots of them in Europe too. So my question is about your standing uh, feeding stalks, like the image you show from your um, colleague there and what you said about your uh, your own. Uh, I know people might have exactly that one, might have concerns. Well, my horse is going to go and shove the other horse into that very square corner, etc. I was wondering if you could say some more things about these, uh, this kind of setup. Thank you. Really pretty amazing. Um, there are occasionally, I have not had that with my horses. I have had some situations at Clemson. Uh, we had a, um, a gal that does eventing and she has about 30 horses and she has 30 stocks that she brings her horses in. And what she had to do finally was uh, some of the geldings wanted to, <laughs> they're geldings, but they still wanted to take advantage of the ladies when the ladies were in there. And so what they finally started doing was they just have a butt bar across every single one. The horses are brought in to feed. They put the butt bars on so that the horses have to stay in there while they're feeding. And then they undo the butt bars and bring them all back out. Um, mine, I haven't had a problem with that. Once they go in that, since their butt is pointing out, they can protect themselves. Even the lowest on the totem pole is able to protect themselves from anybody else uh, doing these kind of things. Um, I really find it to be quite useful particularly for my horses in Georgia, they can go in there. It's sort of the dark stall concept. Uh, my roof is a lot lower. And so it's very dark in there. The flies don't go in there and you'll find them in there in the middle of the day, just hanging out. There's a lot of wind that blows through there and um, they seem to enjoy it. Great, thank you. Nina, I'll send you some, uh, I'll get your email and send you some pictures and some videos too. Yeah, no, I, I love them too. I know people have concerns about them and can't like believe, right, that this would be a, a, a thing. And I know the, you know, the HIT systems and the active stable systems do have 
uh, these, but the doors close and the horse exits sort of front right, uh, right kind of thing. But here, obviously, the horse has to be comfortable walking in and backing out. But I'm also an advocate for them. I'd love to see more pictures, though. So I'll, I'll send you. I'll that. send you. A, I've got a bunch, a ton of them. And for those of you that are also training horses, um, it's a really great way to train your horse to back out because he goes in and out every single day, and they get they get really quick at doing those kind of things. Fiona, I see. Um, Tessa, did you record it? Yes, there will be a recording available. Yay. Um, does um, anyone have any other questions or anything or anything they want to chat about before we head off? Okay, well, thank you so, so much, Rebecca, for joining us um, and for all of our guests for coming and listening in. Anytime. I really appreciate you having it and send me a link and I'll share it out. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.